Okay, there we go. Now, you want to start in the middle of a sentence, they're going to be saying, watching the tape, going, what was he saying during the... So, I get that all the time. <laughs> so, but I, I'm not trying to just preach sermons to you. I'm trying to get this across to you. You understand? And you say, well, okay, we're still not talking about healing. We're talking... I'm not, I'm not telling you a technique. I'm, I'm showing you why and how it works. If you understand... See, when I used to teach martial arts, there are schools of martial arts that will teach you a technique. They'll teach you, if someone does this, you do this. If they do that, you, and they can teach you for years. And you'll know a thousand techniques, and you'll know a different technique against every attack. Now the problem is, you're like a computer. And the more information is stored, the longer it takes you to access that information. Right? Which means if you know a response to every attack, a separate response, it means that your mind has to see the attack and then sort through all the information and pick out the right response. Which makes you slower. You understand? But, if I can teach you by principle, which is the way I taught martial arts actually, I taught by principle, not technique. And I would tell them, here's what you want to do. You want to end the fight as quickly as possible, doing as much damage to your opponent as possible, in the least amount of time, while receiving the least amount of damage to you. And I say, all right, now here's what we're going to do. Now we're going to attack with this, and okay, now, and I, and I would teach some basic stuff, and I say, all right, now, and invariably somebody would say, all right, uh, they call me different things, instructor, usually they just call me Curry, because we wasn't into a lot of formality. And I said, they'd say, I, I, am I doing this right? And I said, wait, because they'd want to demonstrate what they were doing. And I said, wait a minute, did you hit the guy? Yeah. Did he hit you? No. Did it end the fight? Yes. You did it right. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's not technique. We're looking for end results. Not technique. That's why I'm trying to teach you principle. If I have to teach you technique, you know, I, I'll create a groupie. You know what I mean? Because you're going to have to follow me around, learn the rest of your life. Technique, technique, what about this, what about that, what about this, what about that? And you're going to wear me down, and I'm not going to be able to help other people. Right? But if I can teach you about principle, then you can, there's only a few principles you need to know. And you can find every situation, and you'll find a principle for that situation. Right? And then you just follow that principle, and it works. Right? And the principles are real easy. Jesus, Jesus made it real simple. Preach the gospel to the poor. That's a principle, right? Set at liberty them that are captive. There you go. That's a principle. So if they're captive, what do you do? Set them at liberty. You see, that's not religion. Religion says, why'd they do it? How'd they get it? What caused it? How? Well, they got to... See, that's not, that's not Jesus. Jesus had principles. You, I tell we'll go into places and people will, will know me. You know, we'll go um, together as a team. And I had this one lady went with us one time to a Walmart... And she kept, is, me and my wife were there, and she was actually rode over with us and talked to us. And we go in, my wife and I were shopping, getting some stuff, because we're staying in the motel there. And this lady keeps bringing people up for me to pray for. I, I found this lady, she's got a headache, and would you pray for her? And I'm like, prayed for her, okay, headache's gone. Okay, she takes off. A few minutes later, another lady comes, she comes up with another person. This person has this migraine, or it's like four or five different things. Come in, would you pray for her? I'm like, yeah, pray for her. She started to go off and I'm like, whoa. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm going to go and find people for you to pray. I said, you've been through the training. Why are you bringing them to me? I said, look, you see them, you free them. Don't bring them to me. I taught you. If I have to keep doing it, then you didn't listen or I didn't do my job right. And when I'm gone, what are you going to do then? While I'm here, bring them, bring them over here and you do it. And I'll watch you. And if you do it good, they'll get healed. It'll be okay. If it don't work, I'll... Try to help you out some, but use me while I'm here to coach you, but don't use me to do it. Right. right? Do it yourself. Because when I'm gone, I'm not going to be there to do it for you, and then you're going to be wondering, am I doing it right? Am I doing it? See, it's going to be by principle. My whole purpose is to reproduce, not to create followers. You understand what I mean? I'm not here trying to gather you as followers, per se. I'm here to try to reproduce so that when I'm gone, you'll touch people in your world that I will never meet. That's the point. You know, hopefully someday I'll work myself out of a job. Amen? When that happens, maybe God will promote me somehow. Either up or out. One of the two. I don't care. Okay? <laughs> so, all right. 
He says, <clears throat> let's go to uh, verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. And he, this is all legalistic. Remember this is written to the Hebrews, predominantly Christian Hebrews, that understood the law and the, tri the tribes and Aaron and the priesthood and all that. So unless you want to go ahead and study all that, I'm not going to get into that now, but if you want to study it, you can. It says uh, in verse 14, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. So in other words, he wasn't out of the, the line of Aaron and all that. He says, And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest. So in other words, he's a priest like Melchizedek, not like Aaron, Moses, and him who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And there is verily a, di a disannulling, you hear that? Disannul, to take away, the co of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. You hear that? The old covenant, the, the law, had a weakness, and it was unprofitable before God. It was a temporary stopgap method until Jesus came. You understand? When Jesus, again, I will read the scripture to you a little bit later on in detail, but the scripture is clear. The law stopped when Jesus came. You understand? The law stopped. You say, so we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments? Oh, no, you got much stricter than that. You got two. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. The Ten Commandments were easy compared to those two. Amen? I mean, just don't steal, don't covet, don't lie, you know, all that kind of stuff. That was pretty simple. This stuff, you actually got to... The Old Covenant was thou shalt not. The New Covenant is thou shalt. You understand? That's the difference. So you can't just sit and do nothing. Because then you're thou shalt not. You got to do something. You understand? You, you can't sit and love people. Right? It's not enough to say, I love people. He said, how can you say... Listen to this. He said, you see your brother in need. You can't just say, oh, be warmed, be filled, be blessed, and go your way. You've got to do something. He said, pure and undefiled religion is to keep yourself pure, but it is to visit the widow and the orphan. It's, see, it is to help. It's, it, see, that doesn't sound real spiritual. It doesn't say pure and undefiled religion is to prophesy and sing and dance and shout. It says it is to touch people. Jesus said if you do this, you, you feed the hungry, you clothe the naked, you visit those in prison. If you do it to them, you've done it to me. They said, Lord, when, would you, when did we see that? He said, you did it to me when you did it to the least of these. Isn't that right? See, Christianity is not... Understand, I'm absolutely... I believe in power. I believe in healing. That's what we're here for. But if you really want to see healing and power, get involved in people's lives. Start to touch people's lives. It, that's what William Booth, probably the, the, one of the greatest Christians and one of the greatest organizations, Christian organizations ever started was the Salvation Army. The way it was started, not what it is today. Okay, it's completely different from what it was. But what William Booth did, he understood. You can't really get through to a man about his soul be, when he can't hear you because his stomach's growling from hunger. You understand? He said we've got to be able to feed them We've got to be able to clothe them. We've got to show them the love of God because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Amen? Amen? And, and many times, you know, you walk up and want to preach to somebody, they don't want to hear it. But you walk up and feed them. And they'll listen. See, we've got to realize that this is... It's, our, our, I did a... I may be back there, I don't know. But I did a message called How to Be, Spirit, or how to be Spiritual in a Natural World. And I go into detail on this about how being spiritual in a natural world doesn't mean walking around in a cloud, you know, in the spirit, so to speak. The Bible says if the spirit of God dwell in you, you're in the spirit. It doesn't say I have to get off in the spirit and act weird, right? I'm not saying you can't get drunk in the spirit. It's good at times. But that's not the epitome. The epitome is when you show Christ to people, meaning you meet their need. If they need food, feed them. If they need healing, heal them. You understand? Whatever it is. Don't settle for natural. Don't settle for just supernatural. Let it be supernatural. You understand? Whatever need, meet the need. 
Amen? You hear? You get this? <laughs> I hope you hear the heart of the Father in this. Anyway, he says, now watch. In verse 19, For the law made nothing perfect. Do you hear that? The law made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope did. And what's the better hope? New covenant. By the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, once Jesus was set in as high priest, it's forever. Right? So there's nothing else. <clears throat> By so much was Jesus, now listen carefully, made the guarantee or the surety of a better covenant. You hear that? Better covenant. The new covenant is a better covenant. Not the old covenant. Now, we're going to go into more of this a little bit later on because <clears throat> i got to send you to lunch. But, I want you to, to understand... <clears throat> And this will answer your question about Paul and Paul's thorn, because that always comes up. You know, well, Paul's thorn was he was blind or he had eye problems and he had one person said he had ophthalmia, which was this horrible disease, and made pus run down his eyes and all that kind of stuff. And okay, first off, if that were true, it said that they took aprons from Paul and he sent them out, and if people were sick, they got healed. Okay, ophthalmia is highly contagious and it's a runny pus that runs down the face. And if Paul had an apron on, okay, he's a man. What's he going to do? Come on. He's going to be wiping that stuff off. Now, is that the prayer cloth you want? <coughs> All right, you think that's going to heal people? <clears throat> you know, a cloth infected with ophthalmia, an eye disease? No, he didn't have an eye disease. There's nothing in the Bible that says he had an eye disease. He used a, a term where he said, you would have plucked your own eyes out for me. Okay, that didn't mean he had a bad eye any more than people would say, well, I'll tell you what, that man, that, that is such a good brother. Man, he'd cut off his right arm from me. Well, that doesn't mean you got a bad arm. Right? It's just, it's a figure of speech to show endearment. And that's what Paul was saying. He said, the first time I came, he's right into the Galatians. And he said, the first time I came to you, you, you could have been tempted by the infirmity of my flesh to refuse me. But instead... You didn't pay any attention to that, and you received me as an angel from God, even as Christ himself. And as people say, well, wait, wait, what about that infirmity of the flesh? Okay, infirmity can mean a lot of things. And you have to look up and see how it's used in each case to figure out what it is. And when Paul was using an infirmity, if you go, and again, you don't just get this just by reading, you got to trace Paul's history. When you look at where Paul wrote this to, he wrote it to the Galatians. Well, when Paul went on his first missionary journey into Galatia, the first city he went into, the Judaizers came in right behind him, stirred up the crowd, and they stoned him in Lystra. Took him out to the edge of the city because he, they figured he was dead. Now, if you've ever seen somebody that was stoned, it ain't pretty. All right? And when they get done, the people aren't neat. Right? They, these were not little rocks. You know, not even baseball size rocks. We're talking about rocks, okay? They stoned him until they thought he was dead. Possibly he was, it's not for sure. But they stoned him with these rocks. Now, when that happens, that means you're going to be cut, you're going to be bruised, you're going to be bleeding. If you get hit in the head with a rock, blood's going to, head wounds bleed a lot, your hair's going to be matted with blood. All this stuff's going on. If you get hit in the face, you may have black eyes, you may have broken ribs, you could, you could hit with a rock like that, it could break an arm. And right after that, he went around the rest of Galatia preaching. Now, understand he wasn't sick. He didn't need healing in that sense of, of you know, healing like from sickness. But he was bruised. He was battered. There's no telling what marks on him. Because he said, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Isn't that right? Well, what do you think those marks were? Well, they were marks from, he was stoned several times. He was whipped. He was beaten. A, a whipping... When you were whipped, it wasn't some neat little thing. It left scars, right? And yet, when Paul mentioned later, he said, if, am I not an apostle? And he started listing what, what he classified as his resume as an apostle. He said, I've been in, in, in perils of the deep. I've been in perils of countrymen, of false brethren. I've been, you know, stoned. I've been whipped. He said, I've received 
what is it, uh, 39 or 40 stripes minus one, what was it, five different times or something like that? He said, I've been beaten with, with rods. And his whole list of resume as an apostle had to do with persecution. Every one of them. There's nothing there about sickness. Amen? And yet, he said, now there was given to me an angel or a messenger from Satan. The word messenger is the Greek word angelos, which means a, 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 an angel. It means messenger. He said, there was given to me a messenger from Satan that was sent to buffet me to keep me from being exalted above measure. Now, to the Jews, when Paul went to the Jews, if a Jew or a Jewish person found out that a person had been stoned or whipped by the elders of another city, then they were counted as cursed, cast out, and not to be listened to. You understand? So, that angel, that messenger of Satan, it wasn't a demon. Paul didn't have a demon in him. Okay? You don't have a demon and write two-thirds of the New Testament. Okay? The demon, the angel of Satan, the messenger of Satan that was assigned to him to buffet him. Now, notice the word buffet. It means to strike over and over. Right? You look at the word buffet. What, it's not buffet. It's buffet. Okay? We like to buffet our bodies. Paul said to buffet our bodies. Okay? Now, he said, you, you look at that word. That word means to strike over and over again. What? Look at Paul's life. Everywhere Paul went, that religious spirit would stir up the Judaizers that would come in when Paul is there and say, this man is turning everybody against our religion. This man has to be cast out. And they would stir the people up until a riot would start. He'd be whipped and beaten and it happened everywhere he went. So you could say he was buffeted over and over and over again. Had nothing to do with sickness or disease. And, Paul, and right after Paul was stoned in Lystra, he gets up and he goes to preach to these other people. And then later, he writes back to those people and says, When I came to you, I had an infirmity of the flesh. Well, yeah, after you've just been stoned, you're going to have an infirmity of the flesh too. doesn't mean sickness. It means bruises, beatings, wounds, scratches, you know, cuts, scars. I mean, for all we know, his nose was broken. All kinds of things could have happened. But it's amazing how we have built Paul's thorn in it. And matter of fact, if you look up the word thorn... Everywhere the word thorn is used. Because you, you have to let the Bible interpret itself. Right? You can't just make it up and say, oh, well, this means this. No. Paul said, this thorn that was given to me, this thorn in my flesh. Okay? You look up the word thorn, back in the book of Numbers and several other places, every time the word thorn in their sides and pricks in their eyes and this kind of stuff was used, it was referring to people. Every time. And it was always people who persecuted the Hebrew people. Every time. God said the Canaanites are going to be thorns in your sides. He didn't say there are going to be demons coming in. He didn't say the, the Canaanites are going to be sicknesses to you. Right? They weren't sicknesses. They were persecuting them. They were attacking them. They were hitting them over and over again. It's the same thing. And yet for some reason, mainly because of a failure to produce power, preachers at some point came up with the idea that Paul's thorn was an eye disease that some have even gone as far as to say that he got it whenever Jesus struck him blind on the road to Damascus. And it was always there as a reminder, you know, of what happened, all right? The Bible says that Paul was healed of that and the scales fell off his eyes, all right? So he was healed. And he said that, that his thorn, that he, didn't, he didn't give any listing of sickness or disease in his list of resume. He didn't say anything about that. You know, he, he didn't say, well, man, I've been beaten, I've been whipped, I've gone through, I was a shipwreck, and I've been, I've been naked, I've been in peril, and peril, not to mention this stupid eye disease I can't get rid of, I've been praying for and praying for it. And people say, well, yeah, but Paul prayed three times, and God said no. No, he didn't. Paul, it said, Paul besought the Lord three times that this infirmity, this thorn in the flesh, could be removed from him. Now, we have been promised healing. But you have not been promised deliverance from persecution. Gee, and, and Paul, God didn't say no. God said, listen, Paul, my grace is sufficient. Look, I can't get the persecution off you, but I'll tell you this. My grace is with you. You will come through it. You will stand before kings. You will do what I've called you to do. Don't worry. They may persecute you, but you're not going to die until I'm ready. Isn't that right? So we're not promised. Jesus said... 
I actually, I, well, yeah, Jesus too. He said that all, well, Paul said it later on, actually, the actual words, but he said all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Amen? So this idea that Paul's thorn was some sickness is ridiculous. You know? Paul healed the sick, raised the dead. He generated faith in people. Now you can't tell me he stood up there with pus running from his eye, and he's talking about a Christ who heals, and he's going to generate faith while he's got this eye disease. All right? The Bible says we that preach the gospel should be first partakers of the gospel. It, Paul preached healing. If we're going to preach healing, then we should be first partakers. We should be healed. Doesn't mean you can't heal until you're healed. The Bible says to pray for one another that you might be healed. So just because you're sick, if you want to be healed, guaranteed way to get healed. Go pray for the sick. What's that called? Sowing and reaping. Amen? I can go on and on. We, I mean, I could go on this thing for some time because I have done extensive study in Paul's life. And it is amazing when you look at what all Paul did. Amen? And, and he said, I, I've labored more than you all. Isn't that right? Now think about that. Here's Paul, a man with an eye disease that has done so much, and yet he's labored more than all the other apostles. That's, you know, all these other guys that were well, that's pretty good. I mean, I, come on, we can go on with this for a long time. So it just gives you an idea, but it's amazing how somebody can come up with something about how he was sick and how that spreads like wildfire. And I don't care who you talk to in church today. Everybody knows about Paul's thorn. That's the first thing. What about Paul's thorn? Everybody knows about Timothy's stomach. You know, well, what about Timothy's stomach? Well, everybody knows that Paul left somebody sick somewhere. They're not sure who it was or where, but they, they remember he left somebody sick. So Paul couldn't get everybody healed, okay? Which, by the way, Trophimus did get healed, right? And he met up with him later on. And actually, Trophimus was almost similar to Paul in that he actually worked himself into exhaustion. It wasn't sickness, right? It was exhaustion, physical exhaustion. And when you read about Timothy's stomach, Timothy was a young man in an area that he did, had not lived in before. Paul said, listen, take a little wine for your stomach's infirmities, many infirmities in your stomach. In other words, Timothy had some stomach situation going on. Now, I don't know if you've ever been a missionary anywhere, but most missionaries, when they go to a new area, guess what's the first thing that happens? Right? The food's different, the water's different, and, and if you want to purify water, real simple. Take some wine, pour it in your water, just a little bit. You don't have to, you don't, you know, it doesn't have to be enough to get drunk. Okay? But if you take just a few drops of wine and put it in water, almost any water, it'll purify it because the wine will kill all the bacteria. And yet everybody's, oh, see, he told him to take wine as a medicine. Okay, wine isn't medicine, right? It just, it gets you drunk, right? It wasn't a medicine, but it will kill the bacteria. And if your stomach is acting up because of bad water, okay, people say, well, why didn't you tell him just to believe God? Why don't you just believe God? Let's go to your house. Let's see what's in your medicine cabinet, right? You want to put that on them, but you don't want to live it. You want to put a burden on them that you can't carry. You say, come on, let's, let's just be real, all right? And so, but if you, you go in and put a little water, or put a little wine in the water, clear right up. Amen? I've been almost 30 countries now. I have taken babies, hugged babies, hugged people, had people burning up with fever from HIV, from every kind of sickness and disease you can imagine, from, from diseases, uh, dengue fever, uh, malaria, you name it. And I have purposely taken them, hugged them. In Africa, I took people that were burning, had sweat running down their face from, from HIV and taken them and hugged them to me. I've had people cough on me, breathe on me. One man had spinal meningitis and was in a coma. He, actually, he was brain dead for 13 days. And I got down in front of his face so I could feel the, the breath. And they, the doctors threw a fit. And I have never caught a thing. Nothing. Nothing. I've been everywhere and like this stupid swine flu. Yeah, I ain't catching that either. I ain't getting nothing from a pig. <laughs> All right? And I ain't catching it from another person that got it from somebody that got it from a pig. Amen? If it comes near me, it has to die. And so well, we see this. Stuff. It, it, can, it doesn't have the right to live around us. You understand? Life emanates from us. And whatever comes, up, comes near us, we should be like... Divine bug zappers. That stuff comes near, it's just dead. Shouldn't even be able to live on us. Amen? That's the way it should be. Amen? And so, and we got to, I mean, come on. Do you realize, you know, pigs are among the smartest animals. 
Isn't that right? I mean, that's what they, they say. They're even smarter than dogs, right? And they are smart. They're supposed to be smart animals. And the Bible proves that they are smart and even proves that they're smarter than many humans. Because remember whenever Jesus was casting out devils and they said, let us go to these pigs? And Jesus said, okay, go. Because no Jew is supposed to be eating a pig anyway, so they should have been safe there, right? And nobody would have got them because they're not supposed to be eating the pigs. But then whenever the, it said, as soon as the, the demons went into the pigs, what was the first thing the pigs did? Ran off the cliff to kill themselves, right? Even pigs are smart enough to know better than to live with a demon in them. Humans aren't that smart. I'm not saying humans should commit suicide, obviously, but at least they should understand that they don't want to live with, with a demon. Amen? Instead, we got humans that are stupid enough to go looking for demons. They just don't know it. You know, they're going looking for something that comes with a demon. Amen? Go to lunch. See you at 2 o'clock. Yes. Now. Okay. Yep. Okay, now. <clears throat> we have been talking about the old and new creation, or old and new covenant, sorry. <clears throat> now. A couple of things that I want you to think about. <clears throat> if you... If you tried to describe a sunset to a blind person, you're going to find it hard to do, right? Especially if they've been blind all their life, right? Because you're trying to think of common ground to start from to give them some basis to relate to, right? Now, what if... Well, let me, again, say something else first. Almost every legend, myth, things like that has at least some basis in reality. At some point, there was some truth. It may be vastly different from the story that's come down the line. But, and I'm talking about mythology and that kind of stuff. But, even in the Bible, if you go back and read some of the history and it talks about various things that would be very hard to um, picture today. But, I guess the hardest part of my job is this. Everything that every preacher says, including myself, is going to be taken into account and you're going to try to find out where what I'm saying fits in with what you already know. And so you're going to try to make it line up with something or you're tr going to try to compare it with something that you already know about. Now... That's, that's the hard part about preaching is that because if you're really preaching the truth you are taking divine words of God. <clears throat> words that are literally so far above humanity and, and human thinking that even to be able to describe something you almost have to bring it down out of divinity and speak into humanity. You understand what I'm saying? And when you do that, then it's already lost some of what it was. Just because you're talking to humans. It's like trying to explain... It's like a, a college professor talking to a two-year-old. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying I'm the college professor and you're the two-year-old. I'm not... Don't use that analogy. I'm not talking about that. But I'm saying it's... If you try to take divine things and work them into human understanding, then one of two things are going to happen. Only two things can happen. Well... Three, technically. Either we're going to take the divine and bring it down to human. Or you're going to take the human and raise it to divine. Or you're going to get a mixture that's not going to be right on either end. Alright? So, <clears throat> that's the hard part of my job. That's probably the hardest part of any Christian ministry is seeing absolute truth and trying to get that across in a way that in, it's not in any way lessened or compromised. Now, because humans have a way of thinking that it's really strange how we think. Because on one hand, we will think well, remember the good old days. Man, those days were better than these days. I mean, that was awesome 
you know, things happened back then that aren't happening now. And I, and, and I can tell you, that's not true. Right? In the, you get, there's a book called Azusa Street by Frank Bartleman. You can read that. It's a good book. Don't go along with all of his theology because they had some messed up theology. They believed in, uh, you know, suffering for suffering's sake. You understand? Now, God talks about suffering, but there's a purpose behind it. And, and they thought that, you know, uh, honestly, being broke financially was godly. Okay? Sinners can be rich or sinners can be broke. So broke and rich isn't in and of itself godly. It's what you do when you're broke or rich. You understand? It's how you handle broke or rich. You understand? <clears throat> now, in there's another book called The Winds of God. That's, a, that's, a, another, that's a really good one. Um, it talks about the early days from 1901 to 1914. And it gives you an idea of how these people thought, the commitment, the, the, how back then when they got filled with the Spirit, that's what's so different about then and now. We think either back in the old days was the great days, or we think this is better, and, or, or generally we think old days are better, or the future is going to be better. But right now, nothing's really happening. You know, anything that is happening, okay, it's good, but it's not as good as it's going to be, and it's not as good as it used to be. And if you go back 10 years, then the people would say the same thing. You know, well, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> you know, the 1980s, oh, those are the good years. I remember that's when I got born again. And, and, but I'll tell you what, right now in the 90s, nothing's really happening. But I know after the, after the year 2000, oh, God's going to do some stuff. You know, and you just move it forward. Every 10 years and somebody's got something. So it's never as good right now. But I'll tell you what. You read those early stories and they were totally excited when they had three people get filled with the Spirit. When they had 20 people at a meeting. They thought, oh, this is it. And you go back and read about the revivals and the revivals hardly ever had more than 100 people. Hardly ever. Azusa Street, when it was packed out, couldn't fit more than about 200. Right? It was... 60 foot long and 40 foot wide. And I mean, they would pack in there and the heyday, it lasted three years. Right? And then things started happening and dissipating and all kinds of stuff. So, when you go back and you study these things, and let me give you the example, because, um, see, I hesitate to say things because I know a lot of you don't know me, so you don't know what heart or motivation I'm saying them with. But if you don't get a hold of it, if you don't hear where I'm coming from, then you're really probably wasting your time here anyway. Right? Because you're going to be set in a mindset and you're going to be thinking, oh, you know, God won't use me in healing because, you know, he, He's not letting people I pray for get healed because He's afraid I'll get in pride. Okay, God's not making anybody suffer because of you. Right? Matter of fact, if you feel that way, God's too late. You're already in pride. Okay? You need to realize God's not going to keep a person in a wheelchair to keep you humble. All right? It's your job to keep yourself humble. God said, you humble yourself unto God. Right? He said, if you humble yourself, He will exalt you. But if you exalt yourself, He will humble you. Now, if He says, if you exalt yourself, He'll humble you, that says He isn't keeping you humble. Right? So, He's not keeping that person in a wheelchair to keep you humble so you won't get into pride. It's not God's job to keep you out of pride. It's your job. He'll let you get into pride if you want to, right? The reason I'm saying that is because I want you to understand that <clears throat> this false humility that's in the church, false humility is another form of pride. And, all, you know, and really what you're saying, well, you know, I know I'm nobody, I know I'm nothing. And, and you, you try to act so humble, and in reality, you know, and people clap or something, and you're like, oh, no, please don't. And you're doing that, and you're kind of like, really, you're doing this, you know? And you're trying to egg it on, but... You have to realize, it doesn't... Dr. Simmerall used to say, other people's minds is a terrible place to put your happiness. That's why I'm telling you, the, the point of Christianity is that you die. Because if you die, then it doesn't matter if people pat you on the back or stab you in the back. You understand? It doesn't matter anymore. The praise of men doesn't matter. The, 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 you know, when men talk bad about you, it doesn't matter. All that counts is what he says about you. And you say, what has he said about you? This book. This book is about you. Do you understand it? I know it's about Jesus, but now that you're in Him, it is no longer you that live, 
but Christ who lives in you. You understand that? And so you've got to believe that. This, um, the idea that you're going to be healed, okay, that is unbelief. You understand? If you, if you say, I'm going to be healed, technically you're in unbelief. Because to be in faith, to be in belief, you have to see what the Bible says. The Bible nowhere says you're going to be healed. It does not say that, right? It says, by his stripes you were healed. You get it? So you've got to move beyond, I'm going to be, to I was. Now, when was you? When he bore the stripes, right? He took your sins at the cross. Now, you, you have to accept it to be born again, all right? But you accepting it is not when it was paid for. You understand? So it's the same thing that whenever he, if he bore your sicknesses at the whipping post and by his stripes you were healed. If that's true, then at the point that he received the stripes is when your healing was paid for. You understand? That's when you were considered healed by God. Now, this is a you know, perfect place to be talking about this because this is the best illustration I know of that gets the point across. <clears throat> was it January 1st, 1863? Abraham Lincoln stands up, gives out what he calls the Emancipation Proclamation. Isn't that right? Now, if you go back and read that, it doesn't read what most people think it says. It says something really quite different. But the effect was there. And basically what he said was, from this time forth in the United States, okay, basically he was, because he was President of the United States, of course, but they were in the middle of a civil war. And he said, from this moment, this decree, and this is what's the amazing thing to me when you really analyze, you ought to read it sometimes, it's fascinating. He said, we declare every slave being held in the belligerent states. That's not the north, that was the south. But he wasn't president over the south. You hear that? He was president over the north. He said, every slave held by a belligerent state is hereby free. Right? That'd be like President Obama saying, the people of England do not have to pay taxes because we have declared taxes wrong. Right? Now, the people of England may be happy, but the parliament in England is going to say, yeah, you try not to pay your taxes. You know, because you'd say, Obama doesn't have any power, authority, jurisdiction over those people, right? Funny thing was, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was a brilliant strategic move militarily. Because what he did was, he gave the slaves in the South the opportunity and the reason to revolt. You know, as if they needed one, right? But he gave them the, 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 the right to revolt, right? And he declared slavery illegal. Now, if you go and read it, he didn't set the slaves in the north free. Slaves in the north were still slaves, right? A whole lot to that. But anyway, what that did was it added 72,000 former slaves as they immediately, in Tennessee alone, just the state of Tennessee, they joined the Union forces. So the minute he set the slaves free, he increased the army at least by 72,000, right? So militarily, that was a brilliant move, right? Now, you say, what does that got to do with healing? Okay. Remember, it's warfare. That's the whole key. Now, when he did that, that was 1863, right? Technically, with the 16th Amendment, uh, what was it, 60? Yeah, uh, slavery was abolished and set, you know, completely abolished as a, as a law of the United States. Now, so from that time on, technically, slavery was illegal. But... And, and technically, from that point on, every person that had been a slave was, according to the United States, had all the rights of any other United States citizen. All right? Now, they did not realize that in their lifetime. Matter of fact, even their descendants didn't realize it for 100 years. 
a hundred years, it was a hundred, from 1863 to 1963. During the Civil Rights Movement and everything started. Why? Because in the early 60s, people started saying, you know what? This ain't right. The law says I'm free. The law says I have every right of any other citizen. Nobody did anything about it for a hundred years. But whenever they got fed up, and when they said, you know what, this stops. I ain't putting up with it anymore. And they started, and Rosa Parks refused to get up. Amen? Whenever the things that started happening, when they started saying, no, we're not going to go in a different door. We're not going to drink from a different water fountain. We're not going to do that. Why? Because that ain't what anybody else has to do. You understand? What I'm trying to get across to you is this. It took a hundred years before they even started realizing the benefits of what Abraham Lincoln did. Isn't that right? Really seeing it. Now, it, they didn't start seeing it until they got fed up. When they decided, made, they made a decision, that's whenever things started changing. Nobody did it for them. Those that had been freed and the descendants of them had to decide I'm done with that and I ain't putting up with it no more. Now, it was, on the, it was, a, it was a law on the books for a hundred years. Now, your healing has been a law on the books for 2,000 years. Now, you say, well, when am I going to be healed? When you get fed up. When you decide to put your foot down and you go, you know, you know what? The law says I'm free. So, devil... You back off. I'm going to be free. You get out of this body. You don't have a right in this body anymore. See, when you start doing that, when you start standing up and telling the devil, you can't live here anymore. I ain't putting up with it anymore. You know, you want to sing Martin Luther King Jr.'s song, you know, free at last, free at what, this is the time to sing it. You know what I'm saying? When you start deciding, I am free. He says I'm free. Well, but I'm still sick. Are you? The Bible says that the weak say, I'm still weak. No, I'm strong. Isn't it right? So, what is it? Remember when the woman went to the prophet? Remember the, the prophet gave her a son. She asked for a son, got a son. Years later, son dies. What does she do? Goes back to the prophet. Everybody says, where are you going? I'm going to the prophet. Why? Everything's all right. Everything's fine. All is well. Right? She goes to the prophet. And the prophet says, what are you doing here? And Well, her son was dead. All was not well. Was she lying or was she living in faith? So what is faith? Faith is just simply saying what the Bible says even when it doesn't look like it. You understand? So you're going to have to decide. Now, now people can. there's two ways to get healing. You can get it for yourself or somebody can give it to you. But if you're going to stay free, you're going to have to get to a place where you fight for yourself. Because there might not... Do you really want to rely and hope that the person you're relying on is batting a thousand. You know what I'm saying? Whenever God made you to be a deliverer. See, you generally... You should get started no matter what you feel. But in all honesty, if you're going to set others free, you should be free. Amen? Amen. So, what I'm trying to get across to you is that God's not going to do anything. He has done. You understand? You can't find anywhere in here now where God said, I'm going to do this. He didn't say that. He did it at the cross 2,000 years ago. It's done. The law is on the books. And at some point you have to say, you know what? I know what I feel. But guess what? I don't walk by feelings. I walk by this word. And this word says, by his stripes I'm healed. Now, understand now, remember I told you, I'm a stickler for Scripture. It does not say by your praying and fasting that you're healed. It doesn't say by your good works. It doesn't say by doing everything right. It doesn't, it doesn't even say... It doesn't say anything that you can do to get healed. Right? You can't find it. Matter of fact, you never see anything really that much about healing in the epistles. Don't really see it. Why is that? Be 
It's like people say, well, you know, there's not a whole lot in there about, about backsliding either. Well, that's because God is an optimist. He believes you get in this, this is so good, who would want out? You know, you talk about, well, we need revival. Who needs revival? Christians? Christians don't need revival. You say, well, why not? Because Christians have already died, now they're alive. You revive what's dead. You understand? I don't, I don't run from revival to ri- revival because I don't need reviving. I stay alive. I, I, I live alive. You understand? As a matter of fact, you can't find anything in the Bible, in the New Testament, about revival at all. The closest you come is what Paul said. He said, awake unto righteousness. Well, why is that? Because once you understand righteousness, you understand what God has made you through the blood of Jesus, and you're standing with God, and you awake to that, come on, you don't need revival. You're alive. You got it. You got what you need. It's out there. You're right with God. Isn't that what revival's supposed to be? Getting right with God? And he says, awake to it. He, he didn't say, listen, what you need is righteousness. He said, guys, you need to awake to right. In other words, you need to find out what you've already got. You need to wake up to what has already been given you. That's why I'm here. I'm not here to give you something. I'm here to, to let you know what you have and let you know how you should be using it and how to release it. Now, the hard thing, and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, is that the bad part is, is that the church has been going on for a long time. And we have people come in. There's people that are there. And then there's people that go out. And there's this kind of constant shift. You know what I'm saying? There, it's hardly ever do you have a new time when everybody's new and then everybody moves off or leaves or whatever and they're out and we have a whole new crowd. You know, I mean, very seldom does that happen that way. And the bad part is, is that when somebody gets saved and they come in and they're brand new and they don't know anything and all they've heard is John 3.16 or something about getting saved, then they, the first thing they want to do is they come into church and they're all excited. And then they come in and talk to a person and they try to find somebody that knows something. And they start talking to them and they, pretty soon they become just like the people that's already in church. So they start judging how things should be based on how everything is. Whenever everything is not the way it should be until it lines up with this. You understand? Now, the bad part is, when they come into church, all they're going to hear is, keep pressing in until you get from God what you need. You know, keep pushing, keep pressing, keep, keep shouting, keep crying, keep, you know, keep doing, get down to the altar. Years ago, actually I'll read this letter to you later from John Lake, but he said, I went to, he said he went to a Bible school that had been crying out for the gifts of the Spirit for nine months. Now, you can kind of picture that today because we have the same thing going on today. People come together, oh, we're going we're to come together and we're going to pray every night until revival falls, you know. And then they come together and you know what it looks like. People laid out on the floor and over here and over there and everybody's doing this and crying to God and God send your spirit, God revive us, God, all that kind of stuff. And you hear that and you can kind of picture how it would look. And he said, I went to them and told them, you can... Pray for, you can be here and stay here for nine, for ten years and nine months. And you still won't have, and you'll miss the gifts of the Spirit. He said, but if you'll get up, take off your coat, roll up your sleeves, go out and use what you have to bless others, God will give you more. See, it's amazing. All we hear is teaching on sowing and reaping. But then we want to come to God and ask God for a harvest without sowing. We're asking him for more when we hadn't given out what we got. Now, why is that so hard to see how we're being so hypocritical, contradictory, in what we're saying, preaching, believing, and then what we're doing? You see, what you need to do, you need to go into the epistles. You know, Start wherever you want. Some of the best ones to start with, the easier ones, and some of the better ones that you need to start with would be like Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians. You know, go in and study those out and find out what God has provided. Not, not what He's going to give you, but what He has already given in you and what He's provided into you. Now, because I'm touching on several different bases and we're going to come back to this in just a minute, but you need to hear this. In, here's the thing. Because most people, and I'm trying to kill some of these other sacred cows because I can kind of feel this one coming up, so I want 
going to hit it while, while you're thinking about it. The, the big question a lot of people have is about anointings. Because what you hear is, oh, God's about to release an anointing of this. And you hear these prophets, so-called prophets, different people saying different things, you know, um, national magazine, blah, 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 whatever it is. There's one guy that sends out an email all the time. Every time he sends out an email, you know, as soon as I see his name, click, it's gone. Right? It's just, there's a group that I mistakenly signed up. And, you know, and then at first it was one or two emails, and then it got to be like 15 a day. And so finally I just changed emails and don't even bother with it anymore. But every time I saw his name, I would just click because it's all, every prophecy. Oh, I see, a uh, matter of fact, is the big one that I remember especially. I see over Washington, D.C., angels doing cartwheels. And I'm like, yeah, and I need to know that. Why? Exactly. Why would you send that out? Because it said nothing. Oh, I see heaven in heaven, a, a bowl of healing, and as you pray, God's going to tip this bowl of healing over, and it's going to create, he's gonna, God is about to release a healing anointing over the earth, but you've got to pray to cause it. Okay? Everything he says, I hope he believes it, but it's a lie. You understand? That simple. Because God ain't about to do nothing. God is waiting on you. He said, well, I, you know, I'm waiting on the next move of God. Well, the next move of God is going to be a move of God's people. Right? Nowhere in the Bible, well, let me, let me say it specifically. The Bible does not say he is going to pour out his spirit. Okay? He said, in the Old Testament, he said, I will pour out my spirit. Okay? He did that on the day of Pentecost. Right? Then, from then on, it says, I will pour out of my spirit. You say it into the same thing. No. It's the difference between pouring out his spirit and pouring out of his spirit. Okay? He poured out his spirit. We as Christians have his spirit. Now he pours out of his spirit that's in you. Nothing's fallen from heaven. You understand? Even when I pray for people and lay hands on people, it's not coming down from heaven. Right? It is coming out of the spirit of God that is in me, through me, into them. You understand? I'm not laying hands to, to show God who to drop it on. Right? It is pouring through. So we need to quit praying for God to pour out. You know? And we need to start praying for Him to pour out of if you're going to pray at all. Now, I don't have a copy of my book. Actually, can somebody get me a copy of my book? The uh, Writings from Africa? The John G. Lake's Writings from Africa? Now, <clears throat> The reason I'm saying this is because all of these so-called prophecies and these different things, every one of them, the, I'm not going to say the purpose of them or the reason for them, but I will say this. The result of them is that it keeps you, thank you ma'am, is it keeps you sitting and waiting for what God's going to do next instead of going and doing what God's already told you to do. Right? Till Osborne said, you should never ask God to do what he's, asked you to, what he's told you to do. Now think about that. And he said you should never ask God to do what he's already done. Now if you take away what he's told you to do, and you take away what he's already done, it doesn't leave a whole lot to ask God about. And you think, you tell me we shouldn't pray? See, that's your problem. You think praying is asking God for something. Jesus prayed generally for communion. If you will learn what I'm telling you, I hardly ever ask God for anything. But you know what? I pray a lot. You know what that means? I don't go to God with my hand out. So now my prayers are not manipulation. Now my prayers are fellowship and communion. And I spend more time worshiping and, and glorifying God rather than going and going, God, I need this. God, I need it. And, and God knows when I show up, so to speak, I'm not there to get something. I'm there just to talk with Him. I'm there just to fellowship with him. You understand? That's the difference. Now, <clears throat> well, we'll get more into this in just a minute. I want to read this one section to you. Short little section, right there, one paragraph. It's on page 99 of this book. And it's called An Education in Faith. <clears throat> this is from about 1909, I think it was. Yeah. It's John Lake wrote this from South Africa. He said, There is no education in faith like seeing God do the thing. 
He said, I have a conviction that you can pray and pray and pray until Jesus comes. But unless you get up and believe him for the thing and commence to use what he has given you, you will never know anymore. In other words, you won't, you won't see anymore, realize anymore, walk anymore. And you really pray yourself into unbelief. Now think of that. Think of praying yourself into unbelief. Praying yourself into unbelief is constantly asking for the same thing, never believing that your prayers are heard. Never believe, because once you believe your prayers are heard, you've got to go act like they're heard. We got people, oh Lord, send your spirit. Oh Lord, give me your spirit. Lord, give me power. And then you're back the next night doing the same thing. Well, how would you know if he didn't, if he did it? Well, I'm going to feel something. God's not big on feelings. All right? He really doesn't do a whole lot with feelings. In fact, again, I'll prove that to you when we get over into teaching on the anointing specifically. But he says, the results that God has given us, meaning in South Africa where he saw some of the greatest miracles ever, demonstrate this to my mind. See, a hundred years ago, and again, I'll read another letter later on, but a hundred years ago, <clears throat> Dr. Lake wrote a letter that described what he was doing and said, this is what we're doing instead of what the church is doing right now. And if you read what the church was doing, they're still doing exactly the same thing. I mean, exactly. It didn't work a hundred years ago, and it's not working now. And at some point, see, revival isn't when you get excited in a church building. <clears throat> Charles Finney, who was all up in this area, was probably the best evangelist and revivalist this country's ever known. He had like a 80 some odd percent rate of keeping his converts. Okay? Which is unheard of today among anybody pretty much. And he said true revival is when the people of God return to obedience to the word of God. Isn't that simple? He didn't say it was jumping, shouting. He didn't say it was you know, the new Hillsong CD. He didn't say it was any of that. He said it's when you decide to obey the Bible and do what you've been told to do. When that happens, you're revived. Until, see, I, I don't care, okay, if, if your knowledge of the Word of God exceeds your obedience of the Word of God, then you're backslid. You understand? I don't care how excited you are. Don't care what you do. If you know more than you're doing, you're backslid. If, you were, if you've ever known more than you're doing right now, you are backslid. Now, do I need to make an altar call? Is that the next step? You understand? Because you have to realize, it's, we used to say this all the time, it's not how high you jump. It's how straight you walk when you land. You understand? It's not about the hoopla. It's not about the hype. It's not about the party. It's about changing lives. True revival changes cities. Okay? Now, and there can be cities that reject the move of God. So I'm not saying that everything has to be just perfect. But true revival should change an area. And it should put certain businesses out of business. When Finney had his revivals, the, the taverns would come out and take their, their uh, you know, big, what do you call them, the big uh, barrels of whiskey and stuff. Bring them out in the gutter, knock holes in them, and the whiskey would run down the street because they'd pour it out, and what used to be taverns would turn into churches. Right? Now that's revival. Now, where we were at actually in North Texas, we used to go around and there was certain nightclubs in the area, and every Friday and Saturday night, there'd be a line out the door waiting to get in. And me and a friend of mine would walk right up. They would think we were cutting in line. And we weren't. We would walk right up to the front of that door. Take, and a friend of mine always carried oil. I never carried any, but he always carried it. So he'd take his little bottle of oil, and they'd be looking at him like, what are they, what are they doing? We'd get right up the front, take that oil, put that on the door, touch the door, touch the things around the door. And they'd be looking at us like, well, what are y'all doing? I said, y'all better get in there while you can. This place is shutting down. And they'd look at us like, what, are they closing? And they, well, and you know what? But usually within, within the month, they were closed. We did that. And matter of fact, one kept reopening under different management. You know, they kept selling the building to somebody else. 
So they kept wasting their money because as soon as another one would open up, we'd go up there and do it again. He said, why didn't you just tell it to keep closed? Let them waste their money. Right? We did that many different times. Finally, eventually, I think the guy that actually owned the building actually passed away and now the building's just sitting there empty. It's all run down. We've done that. We've done all kinds of things like that. But it's, what I, the reason I'm saying this is because we tend to look at the church the way it's been. And we assume that the way it's been has been right. So we try to continue everything in the same way, only we try to make it a little better. You, you see what I'm saying? We try, to, we try to tweak it to make it better, but overall we try to keep it the same. When in reality, what if the line... Because here's the problem with most Christians. They're afraid to step across the line. And people say, oh, you're going too far. Oh, you, you don't go... Oh, no, you. Well, what if the line that was drawn wasn't drawn by God? What if it was drawn by man or by religion? What, what if the line that was drawn was drawn there not to protect you, but to keep you boxed in? You understand? Because the, we have exactly what Jesus had. We have the same spirit, same word, everything, right? Everything's the same. If that's true, and the Bible says we are the body of Christ, is that true? We're the body of Christ? Okay. We're the body of Christ with the same spirit of Christ. Right? If that's true, then what makes us think that God expects the body of Christ today with the same spirit should do anything less than the body of Christ did the first time. The first body. You know what I'm talking about? The physical body of Christ. He said, oh no, I've, I've heard teaching on this. I, uh, the guy I heard on TV said that what it is is God, all of the spirit of God was in Jesus. So he could do all this stuff. But now it's spread out equally among all people. And because of that, then None of us can do what Jesus could do, but together, the whole body of Christ can do what Jesus did. Right? And well, that sounds real good. And of course, it makes sense to a person that's not walking in power. Right? And it's a good excuse for why he doesn't have to have power. Now, the reality is, Jesus said this. <clears throat> the works that, He said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall... He do also. And greater works than these shall he do. Right? It's he, not they. You understand? Individuals. Now, again, this because in our way of thinking, we think, okay, if we have the same spirit, then it has to be divided equally. Right? Okay, that is... Um, how can I say it? That's 19th century logic thinking. Okay? But when you think quantum physics, totally different. Quantum physics says everybody, it basically says it, he can be in the same place at all times because of string theory. Yeah. Okay? Yes, ma'am. That's true. That's true. They don't lose it. It's exactly right. That yeah, good. Thank you. That's true. There's no diminishing of the power. You have to remember, the Holy Spirit is God. Right? So even if you divided him up, he's still gonna be God. Right? And now what I'm trying to get across to you is this. I want you to think out of the box. Because if you think the same way you've always thought, you're going to have the same thing you've always had. Right? Now, I'm not telling you to think something weird because I'm saying, you hear me all over and over again. Stick with the Bible. Right? We don't have to go outside the Bible. We don't have to go beyond the Bible. There's, there's so much here we hadn't even walked in yet. We ain't got to go beyond it. Right? All I'm trying to do is get us to live up to it. Right? Once we get to that, that'll be good. Okay? <clears throat> now, here's the problem. What if... The church, because most of us came from a background, either just straight out sinner or through the church somehow, you know, grew up in the church or something. 
what if our concept of the church and what it is was created more by what we saw than what we've read? It, it, wouldn't you say that's probably true? For the most part, as far as church. Because, and the reason that's true, is, or the reason we see that is because the church, <clears throat> the, the Bible didn't really describe church service. See, that's one of the things that stood out to me when I started realizing that Jesus preached about a kingdom and not about an organization or a religion because he never really gave us an order of worship or, you know what I'm saying? He never really, if you're going to set up a religion, okay, go to any website. I'm not saying this is wrong, I'm just saying notice how it's done. Every website, include Moan, one of the first things you put up is a statement of faith. Right? Okay, well find, find the statement of faith in here. You know what I mean? It's, it's all in here, but it's not, you know, it's not like, okay, chapter 4, statement of faith. Here's what we believe. It's not like that. Okay? That's why Luke wrote Luke and Acts. So that the things most assuredly believed among us can, we'll all be saying the same thing. Right? But it's the whole book. It wasn't just point, point, point. So what I'm trying to get across to you is that if Jesus was trying to start a religion the way Christianity has become, he would have done it drastically different. But since he was trying to establish a spiritual kingdom that would have effect in the physical world, then he really couldn't talk about things like that as much as he had to tell you who you are. Because as he tells you who you are, especially through the epistles, that is, what he's saying is, this is how a citizen in this kingdom lives. This is, I'm telling you who these citizens are. One of the things that stands out is that the church today is predominantly, there's a lot of things, different things going on, but the biggest problem, or a big problem in the church, is that we keep trying to go back and base what we're doing today off of what we've seen. You know, I love Pentecostal history. I love the stories and the things that took place. <clears throat> but I don't read them to look at them and go, wow. You know, that they were awesome and we can never be that. I look at them from a point of view of, okay, he broke the four minute mile. So we ought to be able to break a three minute mile. Right? I don't, I don't want to redo what they've done. I want to go beyond what they did. Right? And as long as it's Bible, then I'm okay. And you, keep, you may be saying, well, why do you keep talking like this? What, what's the deal here? Why are, you, what are you trying to get across? Okay, it's this. We keep moving backward to a Judaistic type of order of service. We, we're, we're, we're trying to go back into a temple worship type setting. Jesus basically freed people from that. And said, you can't make those offerings anymore because it doesn't do any good. Matter of fact, that's what Galatians and Hebrews was written for. To tell people who had accepted Christ. What, what happened was, Paul went into places, preached Christ, people got converted. And in the case of Hebrews and Galatians, they were Jewish people that got converted. Came to Christ. And then Judaizers came in later and said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to, uh, you know, Christ is, is, yeah, that's, you need to get salvation through Christ. But... You still have to keep the law. You still, you still need to go to the temple. You still need to go to the rite of circumcision. You still, need, you still need to do all this stuff. But yeah, Christ, you need Christ, but it's Christ and. Now that's the problem. And what we have today, and, and <clears throat> so Paul writes to them and says, listen. And again, we're going to read this specifically later on. Paul writes to them and says, who has bewitched you? Now that is strong language. Who has, who has put a spell on you that you don't even realize what you're doing that you would go back and try to perfect in the flesh what was started in the Spirit? What makes you think that you can do anything that can fix or finish or better what the Spirit of God has done in you? And that's what the whole book of Galatians, you go and read it, it is amazing. We're going to read it um, probably almost a chapter and a half <clears throat> before we get done because you need to understand this because this tells you who you are and where you are and you're going to realize some things that you may not have seen before. Now, I, I say that for this reason. 
we keep moving back toward that. <clears throat> in the church, you see it more and more, and you see all the things, and you've got these people that are talking about feast of this and feast of that, and keep this and keep that. Now, all of the feast, okay, the, the Bible says very clearly that those Old Testament rituals were types and shadows that were to reveal Christ. And if you look at them, you can see Christ in it. Right? But now that the reality has come, you don't need the type and shadow. Now, if you go back and look at it, you can say, and, and there'll be some things you go, okay, that's neat. But the problem is, here's the problem. When you try to base a doctrine off of a shadow, you get into trouble. And that's what we've done. Oh, we, we've got doctrines flowing. Now, they may not be doctrines you would see on a, you know, this is what we believe list on a website. But there's still doctrines in the church that aren't written down. Okay? We'd call them the traditions of the elders. These are the traditions that Jesus broke that made everybody mad when he did. These are the traditions that Jesus broke that made everybody mad when he did. Jesus did not break the law of God. But he broke the traditions of the elders. Right? Now, we have all kinds of traditions. You know, now we've even got new ones that's been coming in over the last few years. You know, now we have a threshing floor doctrine. You know, you got to get on the threshing floor and let things get worked out of you. Right? Okay. Now, here's the problem. And I can go on and I, you know, you name it. Right? Matter of fact, let's go to run, run down the Christian bookstore. Just walk down the aisle and I can show you the doctrines. Because the church is not led by the Spirit of God. It's led by the book publishers. Right? And whatever, you know, the next move of God is going to be whatever the book publishers want to push. Right? Whatever book they want to push, that's going to be the next fad. Right? And people read that and they won't read this. Right? And if you read this, you won't be confused by that nonsense and it'll save you a lot of money. Right? Now, <clears throat> the church. <clears throat> We're going to have to... The way you vote is two ways in the church. Okay, It's with your feet and with your checkbook. That's how you vote. If you don't like something, quit paying for it. You understand? If you go to a restaurant and you don't get good food, you don't go back. Right? Don't go back. It just makes sense. You don't go back. If you get bad service or you get bad food, you don't go back. You know, and I'm not for you know, leaving a penny tip to a waitress. See, I've, I've never done that. You know, if I was not going to leave a good tip, I wouldn't leave any tip. You know what I'm saying? It's just the way it is. And I, honestly, I have tipped with bad service just because I want to try to help them. And you, know, you don't always know the situation. They could have a bad day. Anyway, you know, it's, it's faith money. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> This is for the next time. Hopefully it'll be better. You know what I'm saying? But if I go someplace two or three times and over a period of time don't get fed and don't get real food or get bad food or get bad service, I ain't stupid enough to go back. Right? You say, well, but where do I go instead? Well, if there ain't nowhere around there, you got two choices. Sit at home and don't turn on a stupid TV and watch 15 different preachers You'll just get more confused, right? Because each one will tell you something different. Stay home, study your Word of God, or go and find somebody, convert them, disciple them, and then there's two of you, all right? You can't find somebody preaching the truth, preach it to somebody else. Convert them. Why should you always be the one receiving, right? I, I tell people, if, if, the, if the truth ain't being preached in your area, you're a missionary, right? Start something. Yeah, honor. If you need help, write us. We'll send you. We'll help you. All right. Because the only way you force a change, okay, it is not in people's some people's uh, interest to change. And the way you force change is by not paying for the thing that they tell you God told them to build. Right? God told you to build it. You build it. You don't need me to help you build it. You build it. Right? But, oh, but then they put the pressure on you. Well, God told me to build this, and you've got to give. Well, God didn't tell me to build it. He told you to build it. Right? And if He told you to build it, then you ought to have the faith to pull the money in for it. And if you can't pull the money in for it, 
And not through me, but if you can't pull the money in, then maybe you don't need it. Right? But that's how you vote. You don't go back and you don't keep paying for the thing. Now, I don't know why that seems so hard for people to get. Well, I do know why. Okay, here's what happens. You go somewhere, you don't know where you can go, you, you don't know of a church around you, but on Sunday morning, by 8 o'clock, you're going to be wide awake. 8 or 9 anyway. Why? Because I guarantee you, you, you're going to wake up and you're going to feel the need to go to church. That's what's going to happen. And you're going to think, that's the Spirit of God. I've got to get up, got to go to church. And then if you don't go to church, you feel bad all day. All right? Now, usually what makes you... Now, I've got to be careful how I say this because I, I want you to understand I'm not against church. All right? If it's done right. But I, be, I firmly believe that the spirit of religion is extremely active between about 7 and 9 on Sunday morning. Because what he wants you to do, he wants you to go to church. You've got to go in there, sit there, pay your tithe, do your stuff, and go home and do nothing. And he is, the spirit of religion is extremely happy when you do that. Because as long as you do that, you think you're okay. And you're not. You're religious. James 1.22 says, Be ye therefore doers of the word, and not hearers only. Right? Thereby deceiving your own selves. How do you deceive yourselves? By being a hearer of the word, not a doer. Now, this, the, the setup that we have in the world today, in the church, is geared toward making you a hearer and not a doer. Because your job as the congregant is to make sure you're here on time to hear me preach so that and pay your tithes and put money in and keep this thing going and that's your job. Now, healing the sick, praying for the sick, going to the hospital, that's my job. Right? That's what you pay me for. See, that's religion. That is not Bible. You cannot find that any place where Jesus ever told any person not to heal the sick. And yet, you hear that all the time from the pulpit. You're not ready yet. Hang on. Don't get out there. Don't do Oh, you'll make a mistake. Don't get ahead of God. Okay, he's got a slight, you know, head start on you. Okay? He was here before you got here. He'll be here after you're gone. Right? So you're not going to get ahead of him. And yet, we'll, well, you know, I don't want to get out there and make a mistake. Isn't that funny? You don't want to make a mistake. Yet, every time you mess up somewhere else, well, you know, all things work together for the good. <laughs> Why does that apply when you mess up, but it doesn't apply when you possibly mess up praying for the sick? You see? This is how ingrained religion has got us. Because <clears throat> I'll tell you, I'm in church on Sunday a lot of times, most times preaching. If I'm not preaching, a lot of times I'm driving. And people say, well, you know, well, where'd you go to church last Sunday? Uh, my truck, hi, you know, Highway 81. You know, I had teaching going on. I had a little bit of worship going on. Then I put on some teaching. And I did, you know, I, he said, well, who are you listening to? I was listening to my CDs. I said, well, why would you do that? Because I'm, I'm listening I, and things, you know, come up and I write down. I'm, oh, okay, well, I could have said that a lot better. Next time I say it this way, maybe people get it better, right? Last time, you know, to be the day, man, I was listening to worship CD and put in a teaching tape and got so excited I was ready to take up an offering. You know? So, <laughs> yeah. but, but what I'm trying to get you to understand is that Jesus, okay, he only gave two rules. Not three. Right? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Which means do to them as you would have done to you. That's how you love them with all your heart. And, and love them as yourself. He didn't give, and three, make sure you're in church on Sunday. Do you understand? I'm not saying don't go to church. But I'm saying don't think that going to church makes you right with God. Because it doesn't. Unless you do what you learn at church, and as long as what you learn is Bible. Alright? Is that... Okay? Now, <clears throat> where that came from, really it was, you know, honestly it's back from the Catholic days. 
You know, the, the, the worst thing you could do is don't go to Mass, don't go to confession. Right? You gotta be, don't miss that. Isn't that right? That's where it came from. And that spirit of religion is still there. It's still in the church today. Because the Reformation wasn't a complete Reformation. We reformed so far, but not far enough. And even, you know, 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, the only reason we meet at 11 o'clock is because of Martin Luther. Not, not Martin Luther King. Martin Luther. Okay? But Martin Luther drank heavily. And on Sunday mornings, he didn't like getting up early because he had a hangover. And so he moved their services from 6 o'clock back up to 11 o'clock to give him time to clear his head. And today, that's the holy hour. Got to be at church, 10, 11, somewhere. And that's why we set it up that way. So all these things we do, right? The, the altar call, there was no altar call before 1835, roughly 1827, right through there. No such thing as an altar call. You can't find altar call in the, New, in, the, in the New Testament. It's not there. See, Jesus didn't call people to an altar to a decision. He said, go make disciples. He didn't say, go help people make decisions. Disciples, right? He, he didn't tell... There was no altar calls. Jesus said, change. Change your life. Turn around. When he said repent, he didn't mean make a mental change. Repent meant meant, literally, you do change your mind, but when you change your mind, you will also change your life. And so basically, that's why John the Baptist said, look, you come out here, don't come out here telling me, you know, wanting to get baptized by me, because I'm not going to baptize you. You go back, and you bring forth fruits of repentance. In other words, when I see your life changed, then I'll accept the fact that you've repented. Instead of, okay, I feel bad. See, that's the problem. Most Christians in church are not born again. That's the first step. Most of them are convicted sinners. And they live under the conviction of sin for years. And they never truly get born again. Because you ask most people what they're down here praying for, it's one of two things. It's either sickness or it's sin in their life. And every Sunday, I'm still trying to beat that alcohol, man. I tell you, I'm trying to beat it. Really? Or were you trying to beat it whenever, you know, I didn't see you down there at the bar one. <laughs> you know, and arm wrestling with yourself to not drink. Right? Not drinking is a choice. You understand? Sin is a choice. God never... Re- or I don't want to say He sent... You know what I, say, what I mean when I say God sent somebody to hell? All right? God doesn't send anybody to hell. People send themselves there. Right? But God never made a person go to hell because of something they couldn't help. You understand? So sin is a choice. It's something you can help. Now the problem is, in most people, what it is, is they come down, they come to church, they hear that if, you, if you're in sin, you're going to go to hell. And they go, I don't want to go to hell. What do I do? Come down front, receive Jesus. Okay, I come down front, I receive Jesus, I take you as my Lord. Okay. Well, Jesus said, you, you draw nigh me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Right? So, do they actually get born again? Well, you say, well, we won't know till we see. We have to see how they live. Right? But then, people go out, and now, see, in the early 1900s, in the early Pentecost, they taught differently than we teach today. They taught a different, in the area of sanctification, totally different. Right? And there were two camps. One was Charles Parham, in the early apostolic faith. They taught one thing. They taught, basically, what you do is, if you come down front, you get down there, you pray to God, you kill that thing. Right? To them, sanctification meant you get born again and you kill the desire for sin. That's what it meant. You don't want to sin anymore. And that thing dies in you and then you go out and now it's not you go out and gradually quit sinning. You go out, you don't sin. And the sanctification process was not sinning less. It was every day you would study the Bible and find out ways in which you're not like Jesus. And you would start to be more like Jesus. And sanctification was becoming more like Jesus, not necessarily less like the devil. You understand? That was the idea of sanctification. That's what was early taught. That's what caused Azusa Street. That's what caused the early revivals the way they were. Then a guy came along. It's funny because all these early guys had names that ended in Ham. Every one of them, right? Parham, Durham, Branham, Billy Graham. They all end with H-A-M. It's amazing when you look at all the names like that. 
doesn't mean anything, but just, you know, when you study it. Well, Parham and William Durham were two different preachers got getting into an argument. They got into a major argument over sanctification. <clears throat> Durham taught sanctification, you get born again, and the rest of your life you're sanctified little by little, which means sin drops away and you sin less and less each day until eventually, someday, maybe, you might not sin as much. Parham taught, you get born again, you kill the desire for sin. The same thing John Lake taught, what all the early Pentecostals taught. You get in, you get born again, you come down the front, you get sanctified, and that sanctification kills the desire for sin. And then, the sanctification process, daily sanctification, what they call that crisis sanctification. In other words, it was a moment. And then from that, gradual sanctification meant that you found areas that you were less like Jesus and so you started killing those areas and, but it wasn't sin. Alright? Because the Bible talks about the weight and the sin. Weight and sin. Right? You killed the sin but then you had to get rid of these weights. Little things that weren't sin but weren't edifying. Okay? And Durham taught, like I said, the other direction. They got into an argument in the newspapers writing back and forth and finally Parham said, all right, enough of this. They're going back and forth arguing. He said, let the man with the wrong doctrine pay with his life. Well, that's pretty bold because he's saying, okay, whoever's wrong, let him die. Well, <clears throat> within a month, Durham was dead. Developed pneumonia, died overnight. I mean, was sick less than 24 hours, dead. Right? Now, I'm not getting into the theological aspects of it or trying to tell you how it works. All I know is that's the facts. Okay? Now, the Assemblies of God, around the, well, that was about 1929, yeah, about 1929, somewhere to there, uh, 28, 27, somewhere to like that. And by that time, the Assemblies of God had already formed in 1914, but they adopted Durham's teaching on sanctification rather than Parham because Parham fell out of uh, favor with everybody because of some... Uh, accusations that were made against him that were never proven and the man that actually made the accusations actually wrote a letter of apology saying that he had lied. Alright? But once a morals charge was lodged against, just like it is today, once it's lodged against a minister, his ministry is over for the most part. Right? Actually today you can come back, but in the old days you couldn't. Even though it wasn't true, if an accusation was made, it was over. So when the accusation was made against Parham in, in 07, a lot of people just... Didn't listen to him, split from him. Actually, that's where we get the term Pentecostal. Uh, before that, everybody was apostolic. But to separate themselves from Parham, they changed it to Pentecostal and started calling themselves Pentecostals. So, the reason I'm saying that is because most people in church today come in, come down an aisle, they hear a message on hell or get saved or something, they come down front, they don't really get saved. They are convicted sinners. And they never die. And they don't die to sin. They don't die to self. They don't die to all these things. And instead, basically what it is, is they get wounded. And then they live for the next 20 years wounded. Meaning that they, their hearts are, are, are you know, pricked by the word of God. But they never go through to full death. And so for the next 20 years... They battle sin, they battle every problem, and they say, well, well but, I'm a, but I'm a Christian. I can't have a devil. I'm a Christian. Are you? Yeah. Well, I, I, can't, have a, I can't have a devil because I'm a Christian, but I have this problem. Well, when you had that problem as a sinner, it was a devil. But now that you call yourself a Christian, now it's not a devil anymore? All of a sudden, now it's just a problem. No, you still got a devil. Well, but, but Christians can't have devils. Okay, then you're not a Christian. Yeah, I, you know, got to work with me somewhere, right? We got to work this thing out. And instead, instead of teaching people to die, we we try to put a band-aid on them, and we keep trying to fix them. Instead of telling them, you don't need fixing; you need death. You need to die to self. You need to die to sin. You don't hate sin. What you hate is the consequences of sin. You don't want to go to hell, but you still love the sinning. You understand? Now, Christians don't love the sin and hate the hell. Christians hate the sin. 
Right? Now, Christians don't hate the sinner. They hate the sin. And that's where we've been kind of, you know, fuzzy, okay, blurry. And the, the sinners think we hate them. And it, because many times we have, right, instead of showing them that we love them and we want them free, right? Now, I'm saying, you say, what does this got to do with healing? Well, what, hopefully, as I'm speaking, some of you are getting healed. Not just physically, but also emotionally, also spiritually in the sense you realize, you know what? Maybe that's been my problem. Okay? Because the Bible says a Christian does not commit sin. It means he doesn't live in. He doesn't practice sin. Alright? Now, see, you call it battling. Okay? But if it's battling sin in your life, then you're, that means you're practicing it. You understand? Because the battle is, usually you talk about battling it just after you've lost the battle. And you've sinned, and now you're, oh, I'm battling it, and you need to come down the front, and you want prayer because you're battling So, the reason I'm saying this is because I want you to realize, whatever you've got to do, you know, whether it's get born again, or whatever you want to call it, but at some point, you've got to love God and hate sin. And if you don't hate sin, you don't love God. Right? Because everything that's in the world is not the love of God. And if you have the love of God, then you're not going to love the world. And if the love of the world is in you, then the love of the Father is not in you. You understand? I, I'm just Amen. quoting scripture, okay? Now, and, if, and the Bible says, if you, not only if you do the things that the world does, but if you, if you love or participate or enjoy the things that the world does, Right? Well, I don't commit adultery. Yeah, but do you watch the movie that shows adultery? Okay, then, then you're, you're participating in their sin. Do you understand? And, and if that's true, then you're as guilty as they are. You say, but, but I hadn't done it. No, no, but you're participating. You're enjoying what the world does. At some point, the church... Okay, if you have... We always talk, well, you know, we, I got the Spirit of God. Oh, let's, let's not shorten His name. He's called the Holy Spirit. So if you got the Holy Spirit, then our lives should be holy. Right? So if your life ain't holy, what, may, what spirit have you got? Right? Now, I'm not telling you you got to be perfect before you can minister to the sick. You don't. Judas healed the sick. Right? But you don't want where he ended up either. So I'm not... And this is kind of... This isn't necessary for healing. But I don't want to see you, because when we get done, you're going to be able to heal the sick. God's going to work through you. But I don't ever want you to think that because God uses you, that means you're all right with Him. All right? And that's where you fool yourself. Because you'll start thinking, well, I must, you know, God must not care about that sin. Because, you know, I, He knows what's going on. And look, people are still getting healed. So I must be okay. So maybe my idea of that sin was wrong. Maybe, and see, so you start compromising. Okay, let me, let me tell you, I know I've got to send you to break here. We're probably down the last few minutes. <clears throat> Years ago, when I first started, there was sin in my life. I knew it. Probably people in my family knew it. I mean, it was just, you know, what, I didn't hide it that well. And people were getting healed. And so I started, I started thinking, well, is that really a sin then? I mean, people are getting healed. Maybe that's just my religiosity. You know, maybe I was just being religious and thinking that wasn't right, or, and now it, maybe it's not that big a deal. And so, finally, I started thinking, no, that's, you know, I'm pretty sure that's sin. <laughs> you know, wasn't, wasn't a whole lot of doubt, to be honest with you. And I started thinking about it. I'm like, but God, why? Don't you even care what, what I'm, you know, what's going on here? Don't, doesn't it matter? People are getting out of wheelchairs, and there's sin in my life. And I'll never forget it, because God spoke so clearly, and He said, 